Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new let's play of Hearts of Iron 4 Black Ice No Step Back version 6.0 as Germany with me, Alpha Biomega. Yes, it is true, Black Ice has been finally updated to the No Step Back a couple of weeks uh, ago and uh, you guys have been asking me to do a playthrough of Germany for months and years now, so I actually decided that I'm finally going to oblige because it's gonna be a massive challenge. So what is Black Eyes for those of, those of you that have never seen it before? Well, Black Eyes uh, is Hearts of Iron 4 on steroids. Black Eyes actually started uh, during the Hearts of Iron 3 era and uh, it moved the game leagues forward. It, it just made it a completely different game and I dare to say that it's doing the same thing with Hearts of Iron 4 where it's taking a strategy, maybe even a strategy arcade game and creating a World War II simulator. Black Ice is not uh, very ahistorical, it's almost a uh, railroad-like experience of World War II, which is good and bad at the same time, but for all intents and purposes it is amazing, complicated, massive and overwhelming. So expect a long struggle with a possible defeat in the end, but you know, that would be recreating the history of Germany, <laughs> why not? Well, we'll see. We'll see. I I don't want to underestimate myself, but this uh, is probably the hardest uh, mod for Hearts of Iron 4, and Germany is certainly the hardest country that you can play in Black Eyes, which may sound a bit counterintuitive, but it is true. Fair warning before we start, I usually uh, say it, but let's say it again. Uh, for those of you that are new to the channel, uh, I am a big talker, I am a history buff, I actually studied history at the university, so I like to read all of the descriptions, I like to talk about history, and I like to roleplay, so expect a heavy dose of that uh, during the German playthrough. Uh, we are going to be constantly discussing what is happening on in the world, reading all of the descriptions. If that's not your thing, you can either skip those parts, or you can find a different playthrough that's going to be a bit more to your liking. You have been warned. Anyway, episode 1 is going to be dedicated purely to the setup. As you can see, it is long. Uh, it, is, it is very long and we are not going to be playing in this one. We are just going to be discussing what our plans are going to be. I'm going to be showing various parts of uh, Black Eyes. I marked it uh, into several chapters so you can see where the uh, you know here part is where the industry is political Luftwaffe Kriegsmarine so if you're interested in specific parts jump there otherwise I'm gonna go through all of it explaining what we are gonna do how we're gonna do it so that you can follow uh, the upcoming episodes without any problems and that you can actually enjoy it without uh, having to wonder what the hell is Alpha doing I'm gonna repeat it throughout the playthrough again, but this is gonna give you the idea of where I'm coming from and where we are actually heading, which is kind of important with a game as complicated as this one. Last but not least, I'm changing a bit uh, the format of the playthrough. Uh, I'm gonna be naming the episodes uh, so you can always see where we are right now, and I'm not gonna be pre-recording any. Uh, I have a couple of other running playthroughs. This is gonna be a sort of a side project, which I'm looking forward to, but I want to chill. And I want to interact with you guys because you have been requesting this for a long time. So whatever you see up is where we are right now. So if you see an episode, you will know that this is what I just recorded that day or the day before. And you can feel free to comment, suggest, point out things, shout at me, whatever. And I'm gonna reply and discuss this with you. Uh, I'm gonna specifically do it that way so that, uh, you know, because in the previous playthroughs, uh, as I have a small daughter now, uh, I recorded huge batches ahead of time. And I kind of miss the interaction of, with you guys because you sometimes pointed out uh, interesting things. And I want to be able to react and uh, show this in the playthrough. And with Germany, this is a huge challenge. So every single advice that you can give me, I am going to contemplate. So feel free to do that. 
feel free to point out any mistakes. I'm going to make sure that I uh, reply to you, whether in the comments or in the upcoming video, uh, is going to depend on what kind of suggestion it was or advice. Also bring any interesting tidbits about the history of the world. As I said, I studied history, I still study history, I'm a huge history buff. So anything that you're gonna bring from around the world is going to be interesting for me. So whatever you want to say, please say, I will enjoy it. Okay, so I guess that's all. Now we can move on to the game and hopefully enjoy it. See you in the game. Hello, hello, and welcome once more into the paradise of hell, which is black eyes, because it's beautiful and nightmarish at the very same time. So just to reiterate, we are going to use this episode not to play, we're not gonna unpause, not even once, but we're going to set up the strategy for our upcoming, well, weeks and months maybe even. Uh, I'm hoping that I will be able to explain everything in this episode, but if I don't, then feel free to ask me anything that's on your mind or point out, hopefully not, but point out any mistakes that I might be doing so we can catch me right in the beginning before I get too deep into the game. But I think it's worth starting by a little history recap of where we are right now in Europe so that you guys will... Some of you that might not be that versed in the history of uh, Europe, I hope that I will give you a better picture of uh, where the game is starting and what's going on. So, as many of you know, uh, German Empire has lost the First World War, and it was under the rest forced to sign a Treaty of Versailles. Now, I'm saying this specifically because it wasn't really what they expected. And part of the insane damage that it did to, well, the Weimar Republic, because it was no longer the German Empire, the, part of, the reason for that was also because it was seen as highly unfair, and that led to a lot of resentment in the German nation. Now, I have linked a video in the description dealing with the Treaty of Versailles. I really like it because it uh, greatly explains the situation that was surrounding it. So for those of you that are interested in that, you can uh, check the description and uh, watch the video. It has about 20 minutes, but it's really excellent and uh, brings out all of the key points. But... Germany was basically forced to sign it under the threat of invasion, so they did. What it meant for them was not only that they had to pay the insane reparations that was forced upon them, they were also supposed to uh, pass their high seas fleet to the Allies, which they didn't. They scuttled the entire fleet, so they lost all of their uh, navy. Uh, they had to give up their merchant fleet, which was also taken by the Allies. Uh, they were supposed to pay in raw uh, materials. They lost about 13% of their uh, size in Europe. They lost all of their colonies. And they were ostracized from the international community by not being allowed to join the League of Nations. All of this led to Germany feeling like it was broken. And there is a famous quote that they didn't really have to... Uh, create the Treaty of Versailles, they could just force Germany to cease to exist. That's how bad it was seen in Germany, and it led to a huge, huge societal upheaval when it was signed. But there was no other way, uh, unless Germany wanted to be invaded and partitioned. So they had to sign it, and the first half of the 20s is a nightmare in Germany. The inflation was out of control, the society was uh, broken, and it was a really dark time. It ended around 1924-1925 when the Americans stepped in uh, because uh, Germany stopped paying uh, the reparation. They couldn't afford it. Uh, so the Allies occupied the Ruhr. They started to uh, you know, take it in material, in raw material. And this crisis uh, escalated pretty quickly. So the Americans stepped in and created something that was uh, called the Dolls Plan, which basically bailed out the Germany so that it could pay its debt to United Kingdom and France, which in turn could pay the Americans. So it was a bit of a money operation, uh, but it worked. And Germany has, well, we could call it a huge growth 
and they enjoyed a period of a huge growth in the second part of the 20s, which ironically led to the loss of popularity between uh, the people for the Nazi party. However, when the Wall Street crash happened and the Great Depression set on, Germany was hit probably the most in the entirety of Europe. It got so bad that the unemployment in some months uh, went well past 40%, which if you can imagine that, that's, that's every second person basically without job. And there is another famous saying from that period, which was that the Wall Street sneezed, United Kingdom caught a uh, cold and German uh, Empire or the Ger uh, Germany nearly died of influenza. Man, I screwed that one, <laughs> that one up really. So one more time, uh, Wall Street sneezed, United Kingdom caught a cold and Germany nearly died of influenza. Yeah, so it's not funny for the second time, but I really like it because uh, it greatly shows you what Germany was like at that time. So the second awful period in the German history led to the rapid um, growth of uh, support for the Nazi party because uh, Hitler was a really good speaker and uh, by the time he was already out of jail his uh, ban to speak or to publicly speak was lifted and he could start rallying the support which meant that in 1942 uh, they got roughly 47 percent of the vote if i'm not mistaken into reichstag and they were the biggest party there eventually it led to the fact that hitler was uh, appointed chancellor of germany and since the 2nd august of 1944 he became the Führer, which meant that he held all of the power that was in Germany. He was uh, basically able to decide everything. Now it's 1st of January 1946. In the two years between um, Hitler rising to power, or a year and a half, and uh, the current moment, what happened in uh, Germany is that the Nazi party, or the NSDAP, got complete control over economy, the social and political life, and also the cultural life. So there was nothing really in Germany that could happen that the Nazi party wouldn't know about. And people really let them do this for a number of reasons. The main one being that they actually managed to solve many of the economical problems. But again, there was this huge resentment um, that was still uh, there. There's, there's one point that I didn't mention from the Treaty of Versailles, which was also very crucial. And I, and I wanted to reiterate it here uh, because it was very painful for the German nation, and that is that uh, the Treaty of Versailles stipulated that Germany and the German people are solely responsible for all the damage and loss of life during World War I. So all of the blame for this war was pinned on Germany. Which is kind of funny when you think about the history that, you know, it was, uh, you know, Austria-Hungary invading um, uh, invading uh, Serbia, you know, and all of this mess. All of that blame was then pinned on Germany. So this also led a bad feeling in uh, the German nation. And Hitler specifically was really mad about this and had a sort of a cultural revisionism or, or war revisionism in his mind because he wanted to fix the outcome of the First World War and basically repay Europe for this kind of uh, abuse or perceived abuse. I don't want to get into the moral implications and who was really responsible or, or so, but, you know, I don't think that it's fair to pin everything on Germany alone. So, uh, Germany has been, has been slowly building up. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles stipulated that its army was to be reduced to 100,000 people, and that's not like fighting personnel, that's the entirety of the army. So 100,000 people was all they could have. There would be no subs, no capital ships, no... Uh, I think they did also ban them from attack aircraft and definitely attack them, uh, definitely ban them from having any tanks. So Germany really uh, had to do all of this build up secretly. By 1946 though, they really didn't care anymore uh, because it got so so 
obvious that they're building up and there was really no action from the allies so the charade was off and the military build up could happen openly but until now the build up was uh, really well hidden i say it was it was sort of a sham and i think that even by the 1948 uh, the western allies didn't really know how big the build up was in germany so i'll speak more about each of the things that uh, we are to deal with in the respective chapter but i wanted to do this kind of overall introduction into the history of germany and where it is right now now germany wasn't really alone in this kind of uh, situation it's also fair to say that the democracy in Europe by 1946 was really, really not doing well. Basically, the only two nations in the immediate neighborhood of Germany that were democratic uh, was the French Republic and the Czechoslovakian Republic. Both could be seen as functioning democracies, uh, but that's all. Well, actually, you know, we I haven't spoken about about the Netherlands and Benelux, but I'm speaking about the the uh, immediate immediate perceived threats by the German Empire, which was Czechoslovak Republic and the French Republic. So, so just correcting myself there. Uh, Austria by this time was uh, firmly in uh, the grasp of pro-German parties. Uh, Republic of Poland was never really democratic, um, barring the. Well, not even the first. Uh, first, it was a sort of a military, military state, with uh, with clear fascistic tendencies. Uh, Hungary was also never really democratic, and by this time, it was really leaning towards uh, the fascist regime. So, Germany wasn't the only nation that was uh, really going on this path, and. The entire situation of Europe and, and the outcome of the Second World War was a sort of a, well, let's call it, let's call it a result of the tensions that were in Europe and that had to somehow escalate. So anyway, let me close this, uh, this uh, chapter and at this point we can start uh, looking at the situation. So there's a lot to tackle. I'm going to go... Uh, I'm gonna go, I guess, a topic by topic from now on and try to explain my uh, thoughts and the steps that we're gonna undertake so you guys can follow it uh, in a sort of a logical, logical way. So let's start by the political setup. Now, uh, Germany is starting in a fairly favorable position. Uh, we have uh, partial mobilization already on, which is interesting. Uh, we have a standing army on, which is also very interesting. We have a number of favorable laws in place. Uh, one that I would kind of like to change down the line might be the two-year draft and the 19 uh, to further bracket. We might go a bit higher later on in the playthrough. Uh, we'll probably be forced to go way beyond what I would like when we get into conflict with the Soviet Union. But we'll see. We'll see. Right now it's hurting us only slightly. The two-year draft is uh, hurting our output and building construction speed, but not by a huge margin. And the only way we could actually uh, fix this would be to go to the volunteer only, which we're not gonna, I, if anything, I will uh, have an inclination to go higher to the free year draft to get a bit more um, free population. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see. Uh, we'll definitely need to change the partial mobilization to war economy and later on to total mobilization. Same as with the standing army to limited and then the general mobilization. This needs to happen as fast as possible for us. Uh, because uh, without it, you are unable to win uh, the upcoming wars. You can see here that uh, Black Ice really hurts you dramatically if you don't uh, put enough attention into this. Your air superiority mission efficiency is down by 40%. Uh, your you know division attack is lowered by what? Is it also? Yeah, 50%. And defense also by 50%. Uh, you get a bit of extra factor output, but that is really not <laughs> sufficient enough to outweigh that. It's it's insane. Uh, naval mission efficiency is also lowered. So 
Uh, we need to remember this, get to do the method mobilization as fast as possible, and then the general mobilization if we can. Same with the partial mobilization, which uh, gives us a bit of a factor output and dockyard output, but uh, the consumer goods factories are at 25%. We need we, that 10 extra percent that we can get at total mobilization and 5 at war economy is going to play a huge role for us. Now, um, we are pretty much locked... Uh, to go into war economy until the world tension gets to 40% or we face an enemy that has roughly 50% of our factor number. So uh, either one of these needs to go through before we can switch. We'll see, we'll see. But these are the, these are the key points. There's a number of really good advisors here that uh, we might want to get, uh, but Black Eyes uh, complicates the stuff pretty dramatically because each one of these advisors have a huge impact. Now, I would like to get the captain of industry, but I believe that we already have him somewhere. Yeah, Hjalmar Schacht is actually a captain of the industry, so our economic minister will have to be uh, someone else. Uh, I think that getting a Rufus Pragmatist uh, for the factory output and fuel gain would be good, but we'll have to see. He gives also a bonus to military factory construction speed. Um, as far as the industrial and other concerns go, this will be our primary target here, especially in the beginning, because they give huge bonuses to research. Uh, again, each one has more than one effect. For example, the Schuchart and Schütte uh, gives you a two and worker research speed uh, increased by 15%, but it also gives you a production efficiency base of 1%. Or you could just go with Krupp, which gives you a flat 10% bonus, or I, IG Farben, uh, which is a refining concern, uh, gives you 12% research bonus to synthetic uh, resource research speed and gives you a bonus to refinery, uh, both rubber and synthetic refinery construction speed of 5%. So you can clearly see that you will never really have too much political power because it makes a lot of sense to actually play with your ministers and um, change these uh, production uh, concerns because they they are going to benefit you in a different scale based on uh, the period that you are in. Someone else is going to be beneficial before the war uh, rather than in the war and vice versa. Now let's go to the focuses. Germany has the biggest focus tree in Black Eyes. It is truly massive. I have never really played Germany that much because it's such a challenge. But I have spent about two hours reading through the research, uh, sorry, the focus tree, and I created a sort of a day by day strategy for me that we are going to follow all the way up until the war uh, with Poland. Now, uh, the Situation is as follows. You have some political um, parts of the focus tree. You have uh, the army, you have uh, the navy, you have the Luftwaffe here, and you have the industrial one. Now, before the war, we are going to focus on getting research, uh, research slots. I guess I should have maybe started by research, but I'm gonna explain it quickly here. Each of the research slots in Black Eyes, for those of you that don't know it, uh, is locked to a certain type of research. So you have always two all-purpose ones, every country gets that, and then the rest of them has a certain limitation. So for example, the Rhineland research slot can provide us with research for only infantry, support and artillery while for example Württemberg gives you tank tags and armor so you are barred from going too deep into a certain category uh, this is important especially because the research tree is huge it's much bigger than in any other um, game or mod of uh, Hearts of Iron that I've ever seen there are literally hundreds of technologies that you need to research for every single of these categories so getting as many research slots as fast as possible is going to be an absolute priority for us and I'm going to show you which ones we are going to go after uh, so that you understand my thought so first one here that we're going to go for is 
the land doctrine and doctrine and naval doctrine uh, research slot that you get for getting the first steps in the uh, in the uh, well all of these research trees or focus trees I keep saying research trees but focus trees so we need to get the Wehrmacht commando uh, Kriegsmarine commando and Luftwaffe commando and once we get this three we are going to get a research slot afterwards uh, there is a research slot here and the Bank of German Aviation which is going to give us a research slot for air techs and air doctrines uh, there is another one here which is called expanded labor front which is going to give us an industry and electronics research slot there is another one down here which is called Mixed Industry Plan. That one gives you another recent sort for industry. Uh, there is one more over here somewhere. Wait, I'm always having issues finding that one. Um, here, uh, the treaty with the USSR, that one gives a research sort for armor and tech, tank tech for both German Reich and Soviet Union. So it's a bit of a, you know, it's gonna help the Soviet Union as well, but I think that it is beneficial for us because we will face more than just the Soviet Union. So that one is the one that we're gonna get. And then there's one uh, when you get Anschluss, which gives you a research slot that can be used, I think, for pretty much everything with the exception of doctrines. I believe so. Uh, there's probably a couple more down the line. I know about the one that's here, Expand Kummersdorf Testing Ground, which uh, works for uh, tank tech ar and armor. Uh, but that one is locked behind uh, Panzer 4H research, which requires Panzer Kampfwagen for F2 turret, which I think is a 1941 tech. So it is not something that we have in our immediate vicinity. There was one also for the Navy. Uh, here called Modern Battlefield, which gives you a research slot for naval, te naval, naval tech, and naval doctrines. But that one is locked behind uh, having further naval factories, which we are not going to achieve anytime soon. So the primary goal is going to be to grab all of these slots that we can as fast as possible in as beneficial order as possible. Now a bit. A um, bit contraintuitive, we're gonna start with something that's not on the list. It's called Algemeine SS, but this one just takes zero days to complete. So tomorrow in the game, it's going to be finished. And that's why I want to get it uh, out of the... Oh, and of course, because there is one more here, the SS Junkerschuhe Bad Tolz. I forgot about that one. That one gives you another research center for uh, doctrines. So that one uh, we want to get as well. We can get it uh, after 1st of June 1946. So the Algemeine SS is going to be good for that as a preparation. So that that one we are going to start with now. The Algemeine SS grants access to Waffen SS Division Builder under recruitment and deployment. Yes, that's right. Uh, the game will actually provide us with SS templates which we can get and use in the game including the Totenkopf death commandos and stuff like that so it is really chilling but um, you know every unit is going to be beneficial for us during the playthrough so let's start by the Algemeine SS for now uh, yeah I think that's all that I need to say to this uh, we're just gonna follow a rigorous plan and I think it's going to be very good and very beneficial. Uh, we're also going to enter the Rhineland very quickly uh, because that is going to give us a huge benefit and I want that as fast as possible. I'm not really going to delve much into the political area. Uh, we're gonna get the things uh, when we can get them, starting from the Anschluss, then getting the Sudetenland, then fate of Czechoslovakia, poor us. And then we're gonna go for Danzig. I tried to wrote it in a way that we are going to enter the conflict as fast as possible on the dates that were historical. So hopefully it's gonna work like that. Okay, that covers the focuses. Now, uh, let's go with research. Oh boy, research. Well, there is ton to say here. Um, Germany has a blessing and a curse where it gets 
access to everything. You can you can build whatever you want. You can compose your army whatever way you want. It's completely up to you. Uh, so, you know, there is a too much of a good thing. In fact, we'll need to focus on the things that we can use, especially in the beginning. Uh, until we grow, swallow all of our neighbors, uh, we'll have a bit more uh, brevity and a bit more uh, leisure to choose what we want. But in the beginning, we'll really need to focus mostly on industrial and engineering because that is something uh, that's going to be super important for us. I also cannot overstate that the doctrines are super important here. They give huge bonuses and they added a number of additional uh, good things here, like command, which gives you bonus to your army sizes. Uh, there is a regimental doctrine here, which is amazing. It might seem a bit weak in the beginning. You get just a bit of an extra bonus from your leader and it gives you a bit of a bonus to training, but the second level gives you a huge bonus to a type of unit that you're training. So for example, going through the mobile training technique eventually gives all your mobile battalions extra 5% defense, breakthrough, soft attack, and heart attack, which is massive. Same with recons, uh, same with tanks, same with infantry, so we cannot really ignore this. The operational support uh, as well gives you lowered uh, supply consumption, it gives you bonus in attrition, I think. No, this one gives organization loss uh, when moving is lower by 4%. Yeah, here's the attrition one. So you get, oh, you get experience social bosses lowered by 3% and chance to get wounded in combat lowered by 5. There's weekly war support and so on and so on. So each one of these doctrines is just amazing and we need to take as much advantage of those as possible. So doctrines are going to be important. Uh, we'll try to, again, focus on what we can get and what we can immediately use so that the benefit will be as immediate as possible. That's that's pretty much all I can say to it. Uh, I also have a, have a plan in my head, but uh, we're going to have to be a bit, eh, a bit, a bit creative here. Now, one thing that I want to point out and uh, that might seem a bit illogical, but I'm trying to plan ahead is that we will need to, under the naval, uh, get the improved transport ship. Now this technology costs 809 days worth of research, which might seem insane, but otherwise we are locked to a naval invasion of uh, two divisions. And I have no idea how uh, Norway is, but if we want to invade Norway, we will definitely need more than two units uh, attacking it. I will also probably have to create at least uh, two or four marine divisions that we are going to use for that attack. But later on we can use these guys in taking, for example, uh, Cyprus or uh, Malta if the Italians won't take it. And maybe even places uh, somewhere down the line in Africa or, you know, we'll see. Marines can be useful and here uh, the bonuses are really important. I'm gonna get to it when we get to the chapter about our army to here. Okay, so I guess we might start scheduling the research for now to see uh, what the immediate benefits are. So first of all, we're gonna start... Uh, we're not gonna start with electronic computing because that one is one year ahead. Okay, well then, change of plan, we're gonna start with industrial development. Now there is uh, three big sections here. There's energy and rubber, which we are not going to start with immediately. Instead, we are going to start uh, with industry and ignore the construction and energy rubber parts for now. Though the uh, energy and rubber is going to be very important for us down the line and I'm going to explain uh, why shortly when we get to the actual construction tree. So, industry, uh, I think it's worth our time to go with... Yeah, well, we have only two options here, basically. So let's put one on quality control, which is going to give us production efficiency growth of 5%. And the second one is going to go for dispersed industry. Now, you have two options here, concentrated industry one and dispersed industry one. The difference between them is zero when it comes to factory output. There is a bit more of a bonus in concentrated industry where you can have more factories in the state by 6%. 
but the factory bomb vulnerability lowering by 10% for each of these tiers is super important for us uh, because we are gonna get bombed more on that in the uh, Luftwaffe part of uh, this episode and also for some reason the concentrated industry has a production efficiency retention lowered by 10% I don't know what that is all about but just the factory bomb vulnerability is enough for me to go with dispersed industry now as far as uh, military technology go well actually this let's uh, call this slot a hair slot I'm gonna call it a hair slot now we are ahead of time on many things here uh, we have a 1948 machine gun available uh, we have the 1948 uh, truck, uh, which is pretty good, the Oppo Blitz. Uh, we have, um, this is a 1946, okay, the Karabina 98 or 98, uh, but uh, that means that there is really not much here that we could go for. Everything is pretty much ahead of time by at least two years. And the massive penalty here is more than obvious. For example, the improved infantry weapons, if I'm not mistaken, take like 78 days. And if we try to research them now, it would take 405 days. So uh, this one is pretty much locked for us. By the way, I want to get the amphibious warfare equipment down the line because they give a special amphibious support company, which gives additional bonus of 10% on amphibious attack. And that is something that we really want. Plus the marines would be good. So let's check the support units. I think, yeah, we can get the combat engineers here. And the radio equipment. Ah, uh, the radio equipment. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I really want to start using the signal company in uh, here. Because that one is super useful for your tank and mobile divisions by boosting your organization massively. So introducing radio is going to be really important. A bit more... On that later so let's I guess there's nothing in here artillery right yeah this is all 1947 this is all 1947 so let's uh, go with the combat engineer company which is gonna give us uh, the combat engineers and motorized combat engineers these are great because they give you a bit of recovery uh, they give you a bit of organization don't they they don't. Okay, never mind. So they give you a bit of uh, recovery, and but they give a massive bonus to attack on certain... Oh, also on the amphibious. Interesting. And um, the command engine is motorized, give even a higher bonus. So it is worth your time to have the motorized uh, combat engineers if possible. So let's research that. Now we have one more for tank and armor. Uh, the tank and armor is really interesting in here. I really like it. And I think we're going to go right off the bat to Panzerkampfwagen 2. Ah. Because we are currently producing the Panzerkampfwagen 1. And I think that 2 is much better. It actually is much better. What am I talking about? I know that it is. So let's uh, start researching that. After that, we're probably going to switch to the white vehicles uh, because those are going to give us an immediate benefit. So yeah, let's go with you. Uh, Schleswig Holstein Naval. Uh, Schleswig Holstein Naval. Could you start me working on those improved transport ships? You could. You really could. I mean, we just have to have it for the successful invasion of Norway. I'm really not sure that two units will make it, you know. That's just too little. So having these out there would be pretty good. I mean, it's over two years worth of research, but we're gonna get an additional naval slots soon. Hmm. Is there anything else that I would like right now? Actually, that is uh, that brings me to an interesting point. Uh, you probably know this um, because uh, you can you can make use of it uh, in many uh, many mods. But uh, there are historical ship and tank designs here, which we can 
get and it might be worth to see okay so for example the capital ship if we wanted to start building the bismarcks we would need an improved fire control system here uh the cruiser minikin which we want also needs improved fire control system okay so this one is something that we might want to research before we actually get into uh into the uh, naval invasion technology so where's the improved here it is improved fire control system it takes only 105 days so let's start with that one because that will allow us to start building some heavy ships and here we have the Brandenburg. Actually, right, let's make sure that it's that one. Improved fire control system. Just double checking. Just double checking. Improved fire control system. Improved. Okay. Yeah, that's what we need. Okay. Uh, next research slot is in Brandenburg, and it's a Luftwaffe one. So they went overboard with uh, research of the airplanes as well uh, those of you that watched my black eyes uh, italy campaign and know this uh, but yeah it's it's crazy now i'm gonna speak a bit more about what we're gonna do with the Luftwaffe later on for now i'm gonna just say that we are going to go with the research of the bayerische flugzeugwerke 109 b or the bf 109 which is our main uh, fighter. We're gonna need to get these online as fast as possible because the fighters that we have normally are not good. So yeah, and I really like how they, you know, improve these. You can see that, for example, the difference between uh, B and C is just a small one. Yeah, I, I, you're not seeing much, are you? Well, let's look, for example, on, on the air attack. You can see how it's going up slightly 15.2 16.4 16.4 19 19.7 so you gradually improve your endpoints you can upgrade them refit them making them better and better uh, and i really like that agility 62 61.5 58.5 57 yeah so it makes a lot of sense uh, and i like it they're not that expensive to research and you always uh, produce more and more modern aircraft so I'm, I'm really happy with that. So the Bayerische Flugzeugwerke 109 b Cool. So I think that covers research. Uh, what's more there? Well, this moves us to construction. Construction is another huge topic that we have in the game. Now, I mentioned that Germany is... Uh, coming out of huge recessions both in the early 30s and in the early 20s so i think that they modeled this quite well in the game it is not as economically strong as you might guess originally for example france when we look at their intelligence ledger has roughly 50 two factories so they are almost on par with germany bohemia alone has 21 so what about one third of what we have and i think that for example united states at this point have even even more than we do which is logical but yeah they got, they got 200 260 okay that was stupid of uh, me to say but yeah germany was big but it was still fairly weak in uh this initial part of uh it's you know world war ii history and it was also most of the his most of the war there are huge uh huge legends and myths about the germany and their you know military power but it was not all uh roses and it really shows up here so my war goal here is going to be simple we are just going to boost our civilian production that is all that we're going to start with for the first year we just need to get up as many factories as possible as quickly as possible so that our production will kick up later on as we go through uh the game i ran some preliminary calculation i think that we're going to start with building just civilian factories in the uh, first year then we're gonna switch to two civilian for uh, one military for every two civilian fa civilian factories Then we're gonna switch it around two military factories for every one civilian and Afterwards in 1939 we are going to start building the uh, Support stuff and my support stuff. I mean things like anti-air which we would desperately need and like rubber and synthetic refineries now 
they have split the refineries here into specialized ones for rubber and specialized one for uh, fuel production. And neither one of these is great. Each one of them is very expensive. Our military factories now cost five thousand, uh, cost eight thousand, but they actually cost about four and a half thousand because we get fifty-six percent bonus uh, for the for the construction here. So uh, they are super cheap. Well, these ones cost fifteen thousand. It's gonna take you know we're gonna build three military factories in the time for one synthetic refinery. It's really insane. But we'll just have to do it. Uh, this is the same reason why I'm not going to uh, build more naval dockyards because they cost 16,440 construction cost. Just to let that sink in, that's that's insane. So we're gonna focus purely on civilian and military factory. Later on, we might go with more naval dockyards, but I think it makes more reason to actually conquer neighboring nations to get more naval dockyards than to build some yourself. There's also a couple of buildings here that are not in uh, other games, which is the Uniform Factory, Small Arms and Equipment Factory, Artillery Factory and Vehicle Factory. These ones cost 4,000 uh, points or 3,600 points or 3,200 points or 3,000 points, depending on their type. And they give a huge bonus to production of certain uh, things. So, for example, the artillery factory gives a bonus to production of mortars, anti-tank guns, artillery guns, howitzers, anti-aircraft artillery, rocket artillery, and rail-mounted artillery. There's also a vehicle factory which boosts motorcycles, cars, light vehicles, trucks, half-trucks, tractors, and prime movers, and armored cars production. There's, however, two more buildings which is the tank assembly plant and the air assembly plant. These are special. These do not give bonus to production of tanks and aircraft. Instead, they are an additional requirement for you to be able to produce those. I'm gonna speak a bit more about it when we're in the production, but just know that you have like an additional resource for production of aircraft. So you can see that these fighters cost us eight air production capacity. We have 36 spare and 19 for tank production, but these run out fairly quickly. Now we're gonna get a big bonus to this as we're gonna go through the industry tree. For example, the uh, Bank of German Aviation gives us one air assembly plant. There is expand aircraft factories, which gives you free for free. There's uh, strengthen the tank force, which gives you two tank assembly plants and so on. So we can do some emergency, um, you know, focus diversions if we want those but uh, I hope that we're going to be able to balance our industry so that uh, we will never need to build these at least in the initial part of the war later on we're just gonna have to but uh, yeah so just bear this in mind that this is gonna limit our production uh, capabilities uh, they also added and I'm not sure if this is in vanilla or it's a black ice thing they added storages and these storages while I don't think they are particularly useful. I ran some math and considering they cost like 5,000 to get, for example, the rubber storage and it gives a capacity of 2,000 rubber, it might be worth our while to actually build a couple of those. It might be better for us to build a couple of those and fill them with uh, extra, um, extra rubber until we can get our hands on some rather than trying to supplement our production by burning the rubber refineries. I'm not sure what you think. Let me know which option you consider better. But uh, I checked some, you know, playthroughs that people did and it turns out that they have like, say, 15 to 20 rubber uh, demand uh, in 1939 or 1940 which would allow us to stay for 100 or more days just on the storage. So it might be possible that at the time, we're also going to be able hopefully to keep some of our trade routes open. So yeah, that's, that's a thing to consider. And I'm not sure what you guys think of it, but let me know. By the way, there's also a capital shipyard. However, we cannot build that one. Uh, that one is the same. As you have a limit for the tank and air production, you have the same limit for capital ships by the capital shipyard. So yeah, again, that's just something that makes your life 
unnecessarily harder. So just to recap, we're going to focus in 1946 purely on uh, civilian industry. 1947, we're going to start adding military factories. 1948, it will be two military factories and one civilian factory ratio. And in 1949, it's going to be purely military factories, uh, synthetic and uh, rubber refineries or storages, uh, anti-air and radars, because those are going to be necessary for us. Okay, so that deals with the construction. By the way, I'm going to really micro this one because uh, each one of these areas have a bit of a different... Um, uh, different uh, infrastructure and we also have a special capacity limitation in each one of these provinces that we can improve by researching uh, industry but uh, it will require a constant supervision oh and we actually have two extra factories uh, to spare uh, let's look at trade okay we're importing way too much tungsten it seems yeah, I'm gonna keep it and we're gonna check this on when we start the game, unpause it. So if this is uh, too little, we can add an additional factor in Brandenburg and see how much we can put in. We're having a huge production of steel also and aluminum, so we might get some extra factories from exporting those. Okay, cool, so that's construction. Now comes the fun parts. Uh, the fun parts will be the production and the army setup. Okay, I think I'm gonna start by speaking a bit about the recruitment and deployment. Uh, Germany was seen as one of the most modern armies in the world uh, during World War II. That is in fact not entirely true. The motorization and mechanization of the German army was lacking way, way more than people generally believe. Most of the armies were on foot and if I remember correctly, by the invasion of France by 1940, Germany actually had only 10 uh, motorized divisions and the six panzer divisions. So uh, that was way lower than people usually believe them to be most of their army was still on foot so i'm gonna keep uh, working on the infantry divisions but we're gonna constantly train uh, the motorized divisions and the panzer divisions trying to get as many of them out as possible and uh, we'll see how it's gonna go uh, if we shuttle them right now you will see that uh, we have most of the equipment that we need for uh, infantry division well not really uh, we have almost no equipment for uh, the Panzer Division and same or worse for the uh, motorized division. Actually, this is not motorized, it's half motorized, so it's even worse. Uh, they have these different, uh, different uh, templates for semi-motorized and motorized infantry, so we'll need to fix that as well. I think the real difference between the motorized and semi-motorized is just the amount of trucks. Yeah. Uh, was that 495 okay so the motorized requires further extra trucks and it gives you a bit more breakthrough defense a bit more suppression and of course consumes more fuel <clears throat> but yeah I think that's uh, that's uh, the plan that we're gonna have now the important part here to remember is the fact that uh, these templates are not full. We're starting with really good templates. I cannot really say much uh, against them. But each of these templates requires certain tweaking from my point of view. For example, the infantry division itself is great, but it lacks uh, a better reconnaissance. They are still having the cavalry reconnaissance, which I would really like to switch to uh, armored cars which provide a huge bonus to reconnaissance itself, but also to breakthrough, defense, heart attack, soft attack, pretty much everything. They increase the fuel uh, requirements, but other than that, they are amazing. Uh, they would also do very well if we could switch the engineer company to motorized engineers, which would give us an additional defense. We would also like to add the... Uh, the combat engineers which would boost offense and later on either the signal company or anti-tank I think that anti-tank would be better for regular infantry because their organization is fairly high But we'll see 
we'll see. Uh, giving them additional anti-tank is of course pretty good because it increases hard attack, soft attack and everything. So yeah, we'll have to see. As far as the tanks go, uh, there is a certain a new uh, type of unit that they added in this update, which is called Assault Infantry. It's basically attack infantry. Uh, they have a high malice to defense, but bonus to breakthrough, soft attack, and hard attack. And as we are going to actually use uh, the tank divisions in offense only, unless something really goes horribly wrong, I think it would make sense to switch these templates to something like this. Uh, by the way, I really like that they have a motorcycle uh, infantry. That, that's just amazing. Uh, but yeah, they, they are weaker than the assault infantry. So something like this would be good. And we could also add, I think, a light tank division here. And maybe instead of light tanks, an artillery piece. Yeah, we could add an artillery. So if I added another motorized anti-tank and switch one to medium artillery yeah that would be pretty good I what wait what how oh wait I reset it didn't I yeah I wanted to I wanted to do it like this and if we switch you to assault No, that's 24.5. Okay, so we would maybe be able to go like this. This would be pretty good. Uh, motorized artillery, two units of motorized, medium artillery, and anti-tank. We'll also definitely need to add armored cars uh, to this unit, though I'm kind of okay with the motorcycle reconnaissance. We'll need the heavy, uh, heavy artillery, uh, motorized one. We'll need the uh the assault engineers and we will need the signal company for the panzer division so that's uh, what we're gonna do here and as far as the half motorized um uh, go i'd like to add an additional armored car here uh i would like that we could probably switch well they got 24.5 so maybe we could what if we switch to like to motorized artillery and hope that you will be a soft uh, soft attack only and again what point is it you have a motorized uh, motorized division where you have a cavalry pulled heavy artillery so if we switch this one the engineers to motorized yeah you get immediately to six kilometers uh, max speed and that's I guess only because we have the what if we switch it to motorized would that help as well No, I think it's the cars, quite honestly. No, something's pulling it down. What is it? Is it the headquarters? Oh yeah, it's the headquarters detachment. Okay, so that one needs to be changed as well. Jesus, the 65 army experience just for this. It's like building an entirely new unit. Yeah, but you see my, my conundrum here. Uh, we just have to change this. Now, then we have the Gebirxiega Brigade. I'm don't think we're gonna do much with these ones in the beginning uh, i know for certain that we're gonna get uh, better mountainers from uh, anschluss of austria so i'm just hoping for that and then we got the marines here which are just just awful but on the other hand they get a 50 percent bonus on amphibious so we'll start producing some amphibious equipment and hope that uh, we can pick them up somewhere and make them work. Now, of course, it would be great to give them, there's a special type of artillery called pack artillery, which as you can see, lowers the attack of amphibious by 10%, but it probably, not probably, it actually doubles our soft attack and helps with the breakthrough as well. So if we added like two and maybe two more Marines, what would be the effect? Attack 37%. If we added the amphibious equipment and if we added the attack engineers, we would get to, let's say, 55. And the soft attack would be 26 instead of 12. Yeah, so having a 50% bonus with 12.2 or a 
soft attack of 26 with a breakthrough of 20 with a bonus of 47. I think that's a easy distinction, so we'll see. Maybe we could even go like... No, it's 13. What would be the... still 13? Well, we have to play with this template a bit, but this is something that we need to constantly improve and get. We need 400 amphibious warfare equipment. So there is probably a good point in starting uh, producing that very soon. Okay, so we've set up uh, set up the uh, the production of our units. Now, as far as our uh, here the army goes, we have twenty four infantry divisions. We have twelve garrison divisions. We have three tank divisions or white tank divisions. We have one cavalry and one Quebec Siega. I really don't want the cavalry at all. And I mean it. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm immediately gonna disband this one because I have no use for the cavalry divisions in my uh, army. I mean, it's gonna be complicated enough to update the ones that we have and I think that we should start with motorization as fast as possible. So goodbye cavalry. It was nice uh, knowing you. But yeah, as far as here goes, uh, there is going to be a lot of work to do. Uh, actually, let's uh, let's go like this. I'm gonna look through it. Yeah, we got. Oh wow, our Gebirg's Brigade is really elite. That's interesting to see. The rest of the units are pretty okay. Uh, the garrison units are just awful. They've headquarters detachment and the military police. Who designed this? <laughs> uh, Vakhtrup and Berwindo are elites as well. Uh, yeah, I guess those are those are just defensive. So considering we have our units here, 24 infantry divisions, 12 garrison divisions, 3 white tanks. Uh, so that means we got two full infantry armies and one white tank army. And, you know, have good basis for the Gebex Jäger uh, army, so that's pretty good. I think we can we can start working with that. I'll uh, assign them... Actually, we can deal with this in the next episode. I think that uh, I'm going to look into them a bit more to just to make sure that uh, there are no unpleasant surprises. Uh, and let you know in the next episode how we are going to deal with this. But, yeah, for now, let us just get these guys into the first army. Actually, there's more. I can see you there. Okay. Uh, you, you and you, I think, were the ones that were not... Yeah. We can split this army in half. The second army, we are going to put the uh, you into okay. Wait, the tanks are going to be where's the third tank division? No, oh, here it is. So, this is gonna be the third uh, Panzer army, and we're gonna have a Gebex Jäger. Quebec Sega army and the rest is going to be part of a defensive army. So we have a ton of leaders here. It's actually really insane, but I like the fact how it's made. So let's create two uh, two armies here, uh, or two army groups here. Uh, we'll have the first army that's going to be, uh, for now, um, military one. We're going to split it later on into army group. Uh, Ost, which is going to attack uh, Poland, and army group uh, West, which is going to defend uh, against a possible attack by the French, and the garrison army, which is going to protect our territory. Now, right off the bat, I know that I want to have a couple of these generals uh, assigned. I really like, and I'm not sure if I can see him here, there was a General Blaskovitz. Yeah, Johannes Blaskovitz. This guy is not as good as some other generals, but he has really good 
uh, skills. He has offensive and defensive doctrine, which is great for an infantry army. And I believe he might also have an infantry... Infantry trait? Yeah, he's an infantry officer, so he's getting more experience from a leading infantry. And I think infantry also gets a bonus, and it gets a bonus in planning. So we're going to assign him to our first army. By the way, Johannes Baskovitz is one of my favorite generals. He was really adhering to a strict moral core. I still cannot get over the fact uh, that after he participated in the conflict in Poland and actually uh, helped to annex Poland, uh, when he saw that the SS was terrorizing the population, he court-martialed a couple of them to death, <laughs> which angered Hitler so much that he removed Blaskowitz from command and just sent him home. Uh, but he was really, really just like thinking about the people and he was like a true Prussian officer, professional, and always, uh, you know, stood up for the common people and screamed that the Reich shouldn't uh, tyrannize the people that they conquered, that, he should, that they should uh, focus on their problems and try to help them because the population is something that is going to help you. So uh, I'm going to assign more generals here um, off screen because I need to check what we have here. There's so many of them. I know that the tanks are probably going to be led sir. by Guderian or Rommel. Uh, do we have Guderian here? We do. Hans Guderian. Uh, he has... A sponsor leader. Okay, so you can be assigned immediately. That is an easy task. And for the army groups, uh, we do have only one field marshal. Okay, so Blumberg is the current field marshal. I don't think this guy will last. I think that um, we'll get him removed by an event or something. But we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, I'll deal with this off, uh, off cam. Okay. Furthermore, let's move to Luftwaffe. Uh, Luftwaffe is going to be a massive issue for us. Uh, from the Italian campaign, I remember what kind of a mess it is when the war breaks out. The Allies swarm you with millions of aircraft. Well, maybe not millions, but definitely a couple of thousand. So, producing aircraft is going to be an absolute necessity for us. Now we got, uh, as I and I checked that, a large number of aged fighters. We got a bit of interceptors here. We got a ton of tactical bombers, and we get a bit of Corsair support and naval bombers and flying boats. Now uh, I'm gonna not speak about uh, the naval bombers because I'll focus on that when we speak about the Kriegsmarine. Uh, but right now I wanted to speak about what we're going to produce. And what we're going to produce is going to be strictly fighters. We'll use these for defense of our territory from the Allies' attack, which is why I mentioned that we are going to construct anti-air and radars because we'll need every single bonus uh, against them. Now, we're going to get a decent help from the... Where is it? Uh, from the limited mobilization and general mobilization, which should uh, remove some of the malices we get for air superiority. But we'll have to see how it's going to work. And um, I'm going to produce close air support because we'll need that for all of our fighting in Poland and in uh, France and uh, the low countries. But I'm also going to produce uh, the naval bombers. And I'll speak about the strategy of the naval bombers later. But what we're not going to produce... At least not extensively, it will be the tactical bombers, interceptors, or any other type of aircraft. At least not in the beginning of the game. Now I mentioned, uh, now I mentioned that we will uh, have a lot of research going with uh, the fighters here. That is true. If you look every year, we're pretty much getting a new version of our fighter. Uh, we will focus on the naval bombers. That's another every year you get an extra bomber and almost same for Kozar support. Well, you get every two years. So that's what we're going to focus here on. Now I'm going to have a specific strategy for air wings because the game is giving you uh, the airfields on the capacity of 100, I think. Where's the airfield? Here. So... There's five and two here, and you should see that the air capacity here is 500 and 200. Okay, so our fighters are going to be... Uh, I'm going to just disband all of these uh, air wings, 
and I'm going to reset them so that we are going to have uh, the fighters because what, what good is it to have two fighters but we're gonna have uh, the fighters in air wings of 100 and we're gonna have the Corsair support in air wings of 50 uh, that way we can use them uh, efficiently during our fighting and we can assign them to armies or uh, areas and be okay with that okay cool so I think that covers the Luftwaffe and now we have the last uh, bigger topic which is going to be the Kriegsmarine. Uh, the German Kriegsmarine is an interesting topic. Now, we have a decent amount of ships at this point. We have, I think, 80, 83 ships. Yep, yeah, 83 ships. Plus, our production has uh, set us up for a number of additional ships that we are going to produce. That is perfectly fine. Uh, there is one thing that we need to understand. The Kriegsmarine will never, at least in the first half of the Second World War, be able to rival United Kingdom uh, and their Royal Navy or the American Navy. Or any other navy for that matter. I think that actually Italy has a uh, stronger navy than we do. Because remember, uh, due to the Treaty of Versailles, Germany lost all of their navy. And they had to rebuild it completely from scratch. So we will have uh, modern ships. But these ships will be fairly limited in their potential. Now, as long as we uh, are okay with this, what we are going to do here is we're going to use the Kriegsmarine in specific tasks. Uh, we have, as you can see, a number of fleets here, which I am going to uh, remodel uh, between episodes so that we don't have to do that at this point. But uh, we're going to have a main battle fleet, which is going to be uh, located in uh, the port of Wilhelms. Wilhelmshaven, and they are going to cover the Norwegian coast, uh, the fjords and Ar wait, this is called fjords and Ar no Dutch German Denmark coast. Okay, sorry, uh, that was a uh, Dutch German uh, Dutch German Denmark coast, and they are going to operate also in uh, Skagerrak uh, area. So these three areas are going to be covered by them. Uh, I'm specifically saying that because I mentioned that we are going to get the naval bombers. The naval bombers are going to be organized in air wings of 200 and stationed in northern Germany. We're going to have to upgrade this airfield a bit. Uh, I'm hoping to have at least two air wings. One of those is going to be covering uh, the North Sea and one of them probably the Norwegian coast or somewhere. And uh, Maybe I could have three air wings, 200 for North Sea and 100 and 100 for these two areas. Uh, so that they can support our navy in case of any conflict and that they can bomb any enemy ships that will be passing through this area. I'm hoping that we're gonna cause a lot of attrition this way to our uh, enemies, especially the Royal Navy. And maybe even the French Navy, depending on who's gonna operate here. They shouldn't try to intervene and attack us directly in our territory, but they might. The thing is that uh, the ships that we have right now are fairly good. Uh, the white cruisers, Nuremberg, Leipzig and Königsberg class are fairly good and modern. They will require only small upgrades. If we upgrade them, I'm going to remove their mine laying rails for something like uh, anti-submarine uh, equipment or, uh, or aircraft facilities or maybe uh, getting them some more anti-aircraft guns. We'll see. Uh, how we're going to evaluate the situation. What they'll need is a better uh, fire control because that one gives a good bonus and probably also AA control so that in case we get hit by a carrier we'll be able to handle that. But uh, the ships uh, that we have are pretty good. Uh, we'll have to do a lot of work on our heavy ships though because those are not anywhere near where we need them. We're gonna build I think a couple of Scharnhorst class uh, cruisers here uh, very soon. We cannot build them at this point. I think they're locked uh, by an event. Yeah. So they're going to appear here after we get an event. And they're going to be scheduled for construction. I'm going to probably build two of those. And one of the... What was it called? Um, 
we've got Bismarck, Bismarck class, yeah. So we could build two Scharnhorns or a Bismarck class or three Scharnhorns depending on how they will uh, work with each other. But remember the Scharnhorns are going to come online somewhere around early 1940. So we cannot count with them immediately. Uh, once we get the access to Munichen, I'm gonna build the Munichens as well. And as far as the ships that are scheduled, I'm gonna let them uh, be built. And there's a couple of uh, cruisers here which are fine. We have a number of submarines here that's also fine. And then we have the F-class um, escorts. Uh, these are unfortunately completely useless for me at this point. I think we have one or two at this point. One or two, I think. Um, not even one? Oh, one of them. Uh, they're classified as mine layers. Uh, I would agree with that. They really don't have uh, that much good uh, capacity, but uh, we'll unify them. There was actually 10 of these, and we have 10 scheduled for construction, including this one. So 9 in construction and one of these. This is going to be like an internal escort uh, navy that's going to be patrolling and mine laying in... Uh, the area. Maybe we're gonna put them to Skagerrak and Norwegian coast just so they can patrol and uh, hunt any subs in these areas. Uh, and the rest of the ships that we have here, the torpedo boats and mine layers are just completely useless for us because of their extremely limited range. These ships were never intended to uh, enter high seas so we'll just have to check them as we're gonna go through this seeing how much naval experience we have and how much investment we can uh, throw at them because it might be a good idea to use at least some of them as mine layers because they can carry, uh, you know, mine laying equipment. Okay, in limited, limited amount. Yeah, they can have, well, how much would that cost? Free, free naval experience, but yeah, we could we could equip them with mining equipment and just let them loose on this area and just mine the ever living hell out of it, which is gonna be great later on when we get Norway, so we can mine its entire coast, uh, saving us some hassle with repelling the invasion. Same with uh, the Norwegian Sea and. Uh, Shetland, but again, this is this is sound of the future. Subs, I'm gonna invest very little in in the beginning, but later on we are going to send them out to basically create a shield around uh, UK, and hopefully they'll be able to hunt uh, their uh, naval convoys in these areas. I don't know what kind of naval, uh, you know convoys they're gonna have but we're gonna try to intercept as many of them uh, i'm also hoping that we're gonna be able to keep an open route through the north uh here around the rabador sea and the coast of the united states uh it's probably not gonna happen uh for a long time uh, but if this could be open and we could isolate great britain uh we'll later on be able to sail through the central atlantic when the united states declare war on us but again that's that's future. So the navy is going to be uh, small but tall and we're gonna make sure that they are doing whatever they can in their respective roles. It's it's gonna be rough work and a lot of uh, micromanagement but but yeah we'll try our best to make it useful. One encounter with the Royal Navy and we're gone for good so Let's just make sure that that does not happen. Okay, so there's Navy Air Force uh, production. I haven't really spoken about production much because there isn't anything that we can do at this point. We got 57 factories, they are assigned. Uh, so once we have the game running for a few days, I'm gonna check the logistics screen. We're gonna see how the recruitment that we're uh, trying to operate with here is handled uh, by our production and what kinds uh, we need to boost but again we're not gonna do much uh, in the first year because our civilian um, civilian industry is the biggest priority so finishing words uh, what's there to say one thing that I'm not really sure about is the intelligence agency and I would like to hear your opinions on this uh, the civilian agency is fun 
Uh, it's very nicely implemented in Black Eyes, but it's also extremely expensive to operate. Now, we really cannot just send 10 factories to hell to expand our operatives management right off the bat and just cripple our civilian production so early on. So we might do this later on, but I'm not sure how how and when we're gonna get into it. Now, I have a plan for my operatives uh, right from the bat. I'd like to flip Sweden to uh, fascist, if that's possible. I know that they have a special focus tree uh, to abandon neutrality and go with the NSAP coalition government, but uh, I am not sure if we can flip them before they go with uh, the Scandinavian isolationism. I don't even know if it's worth it, uh, if we shouldn't rather just invade them and puppet them, because I would like to, once we get Norway, uh, secure uh, their resources and puppeting them would give us access to their steel and other other resources. This is going to be a nightmare of logistics later on. We really are going to be hurting for rubber and oil because we have almost no production and from the producers here, I mean Romania would be good. If we could secure Romania throughout and before the war, uh, they could supply us very nicely. Hungary has nothing. So from, from this list, really just Romania is like a good source of fuel for us. But again, is it worth for us right now to spend three factories on securing this trade and just keeping it running indefinitely until the end of the war? Well... Our daily gain is 167 and daily consumption is 832, so it might actually make a lot of sense to go with it and sign the treaty with them and just build a stockpile based on the Romanian fuel and secure that import. Because nothing else here is going to work. Everything else requires, well, either Soviet Union or Romania is what we will need. Yeah. I really don't see another option here. We might have to just go with Romania and and get it. So we would get 24. How much are we getting? So 3 gives us 118, which means 1 gives us around 4 day. So 24 would make it so that we are even on fuel. And if we improve our fuel capacity later on and make it work... I think we'll have to do that. That's actually a really good idea. So let's uh, let's secure their oil for now. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good idea. And kill the import of this from Sweden. And I might actually intervene in such a way that we won't need any uh, rubber and well chromium. What is using chromium? That's also a good question. Chromium, chromium, it's ships, right? It is ships. Right? Yeah, it's uh, Grafspie and Hippercars. Well, this one's gonna be done in a couple of days. This one, on the other hand, it's gonna take forever, and the lack of resources is really crippling. And I'm pretty sure that um, our capital ships, yeah, they need that as well. So we'll need to start importing chromium. So let's um, let's start importing a bit of chromium from Turkey. We need a bit of rubber. I think CM sounds great, and tungsten. Well, we need two, and we're importing 12, so I guess we might just go ahead, and it's probably tanks, right? We need tungsten. Tungsten, tungsten, tungsten. No, artillery needs tungsten. Okay, well, boosting heavy artillery is a good idea, so we might just go ahead and switch it a bit to make use of the tungsten that we're importing, because otherwise it's just going to be... 
wasted. The overbuilding, putting a bit of a stockpile here, aren't we? Tungsten storage. Capacity is zero. Okay, cool. <laughs> then we, we're, we're just wasting the tungsten. Okay. Uh, so I think that really covers everything. In the next episode, I'm gonna have the armies ready. I'm gonna reshape the navy. Uh, we're just gonna put you all... I keep the subs uh, separate, but we are just going to... Yeah, I'm gonna investigate these ships one by one and see which ones we can use, what would be a good uh, choice from them, assign some admirals, and we're gonna revisit that in the beginning of the next episode. Same with the Luffe, uh, we need to reorganize them, I'm gonna show it in the next episode based on the rules that I just said. I'm gonna disband everything and just deploy some of them and let them train, uh, that's a good idea. And yeah, I guess uh, I guess that covers everything, industry research, diplomacy, trade, uh, yeah, diplomacy. Uh, I don't think there's much to say here, we're gonna destroy everyone, uh, but I think that, uh, yeah, we're gonna swallow... Uh, Austria, Czechoslovakia, I'm gonna annex uh, Bohemia, uh, give Slovakia to Hungary so that they can do with it whatever they want. Uh, we are going to annex uh, Poland but split it with, uh, with Soviet Union. As I mentioned we're gonna invade Norway and Denmark. Uh, I'll pop it Denmark probably, I'd like to keep it independent, but we'll see uh, when the time comes. Uh, Sweden, as I mentioned, I want as an either as an ally or as a puppet. Uh, both are possible. I don't think Sweden would be able to resist us. So it might be a good idea basically to just ignore them and... What's their army like? They got 100,000 people. If we have Norway... There's basically no way they can resist us, and most of their victory points would be their Stockholm, uh, which is 30 points, Sundsvall is 5, Lulea is 1, I guess Göteborg is at Malmo. Yeah, Mama is 10, get the work is 10. So a quick strike along the coast and towards Stockholm would uh, just destroy them within a couple, maybe like a week. So that might be better than actually spending all of our uh, time in trying to foot them. Instead I could do the same thing and try to foot Turkey, because I think having Turkey as an ally is going to be great uh, when we declare war on Soviet Union. I mean, I want Romania, Bulgaria, uh, I want Hungary, as allies Italy. So all of this uh, is going to be part of our new order, but uh, Turkey always stays alone. Now I actually tried playing Turkey in Black Eyes a couple of months ago and their neutral foreign policy, their Ottoman debt and underdeveloped army is so crippling that they're basically useless until 1940, but they have a lot of, uh, lot of resources and if they get through most of their uh, tree, they actually become fairly competent and could be useful for us in the long run. Though I'm not sure the neutral foreign policy, I think it's uh, removed somewhere. Join faction, tension limit. If they flip to fascist, I think we might be able to use them. But yeah, this is... This is still just conjecture, I don't know. We might instead focus on strengthening uh, the trade with some of the areas, like Romania, you know, making sure that they will keep uh, supporting us. Uh, so controlling their uh, trade. Maybe do the same thing with Sweden for now until we invade it. Or do they really have just... Uh... No, they got steel, tungsten and chromium. Okay, so that is definitely worth it. About you. Wait, how did I? How did I see that? Well, never mind. But yeah, Yugoslavia is gonna fall, so will Greece. We'll see. Okay, this episode is nearly one and a half hours long. I'm gonna cut it here. Uh, I think I've done the setup fairly well. 
in the next episode we're actually gonna start playing uh we set most of the things in motion i believe there's not much else to say at this point so we'll just have to keep our stability high keep our production flowing and uh, keep everything trucking along and sooner or later we're gonna have a coffee in warsaw so Thank you very much for joining me. I hope this has been enlightening. I hope it was fun and uh, I hope that I can answer any of your questions that you might come up with later on. And uh, if not, well, I hope you enjoyed it anyway and I'll see you in the next episode of The Proper Game. So until then, you guys, take care.